I am thrilled today because we are joined by an MS expert, a human that is actually like a wizard of sorts in her abilities to help people achieve their goals in the setting of MS. Please help me welcome Dr. Gretchen Halley. Gretchen, Hi, thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, I am wrapping up a, a series that we've been doing on my channel about exercise, and it wouldn't be complete if I couldn't tap into your expertise. So thank you so much for joining me. Of course. Thank you for having me. If you wouldn't mind, share a few words just in case someone isn't familiar with you or your amazing work or your channel, kind of fill us in really quickly, like a like a quick hello, howdy, hi. Yeah, so hello, howdy, hi. I am a physical therapist and a multiple sclerosis certified specialist. And basically what that means is I specialize in helping people with MS get stronger and improve their walking and basically just make day-to-day -day life easier through MS specific neuroplasticity based exercises. Which is really, really awesome. Now uh, we met, gosh, several years ago, like early pandemic days, I think. Yeah. And, you know, I have been uh, referring folks over to you now for several years. I can say thank you uh, because so many of my patients who have worked with you one on one just find it to be absolutely amazing. Um, I also, uh, before we jump into a discussion, wanted to call out your book. Um, I've had multiple patients say, oh, this was a great point. This was a great point. So thank you so much for doing that body of work. Yeah, you're welcome. It was really, it was a fun process. And I always feel like the book should actually be sold with like highlighters and post-it notes because there's so many little nuggets of information, but I'm glad they're loving it. Oh, it's it's been fantastic. It's been a, a, a great benefit to many, many people I take care of. So, so I was hopeful that we could have a conversation about exercise. You know, both of us agree that in order to live your best life, despite having MS, you have to exercise as part of your lifestyle, which is maybe easy to say, but really hard to pull off. Uh, you know, and, and, and so I think spending some time helping families impacted by MS figure out how to exercise successfully is worthwhile. Maybe if we start off, can you share how do you approach the concept of exercise when you're just meeting with a client? Yeah, I think one thing that's really important to have the conversation of first is what exercise actually means because mm -hmm. so many of us, and I think this is from growing up and even just gym classes when we're younger in sports, we think exercise means running on the treadmill and running marathons and elliptical. Mm -hmm. And if you physically can't do that, we sometimes feel like, well, we can't exercise. And in reality, that's not true. I like to think of just movement as mm -hmm. a form of exercise too. So even just getting dressed counts, going to get your mail counts, walking to and from your car count. Putting laundry yeah, away. Absolutely. Feeding your dog, unloading and loading the dishwasher, mm -hmm. going up and down stairs. Truly like every movement that we do throughout the day absolutely counts. If we discount those and we just think, oh, that doesn't count, we often feel more discouraged and defeated, like we're not doing enough. But if you start rephrasing what exercise means to you to include that type of movement, you'll feel more successful and then you'll stay more consistent. Amen. I would push that concept even a little further because when you think about like the high school mentality to exercise, we're typically dealing with a time in your life when you don't have a lot of responsibilities, you have tremendous unbounding energy, and you sort of have a mentality that if I can run one mile today, well, I can run two miles tomorrow. Yeah. And some of us, when we think about exercise, as you point out, that's all we know. And we can't act like that anymore. Especially when it does come to multiple sclerosis in particular, one thing that's really important is being aware of how exercise in this phase of your life can impact you and help you. Yeah. Because to be honest, some of the exercises, a lot of the exercises that I give my clients can be boring and they might be seated marching. And if you're unable to correlate how that will actually allow you to go for a walk around the park mm -hmm. or to move around in your day-to-day -day life, then you likely won't stay consistent with it because it doesn't have any meaning to you. So I think in our adult lives, especially with MS, but even without understanding what your goals are and what little steps you can take to exercise to work towards those. It's often not the same as when we're kids. And if we have a goal of running, we just go running. We have to work our way up to that. 
Absolutely. Um, if we think about a goal of somebody wants to try to jog again, but you know, but they haven't in a really long time, and maybe they have some difficulties with gait mechanics, maybe talk us through like where you get started even. Yeah. So one thing that is extremely important, I might even say the most important when we're talking about exercising with multiple sclerosis is that your exercises are functional. Mm -hmm. And what mm -hmm. that means is you, you pick your goal in this case, we'll say walking, maybe jogging, running, and you have that goal in mind and you break that goal down into as many individual movements as possible. And those movements are now your exercises. So I will do a demonstration. I think it's easier to understand if you can see it. Right so I'll back up here. Perfect. So if you have a goal of improving your walking, jogging, running, I'm going to be taking steps forward in this direction. Okay. First thing that we need to do is shift our body weight forward. If you can't shift your body weight forward and you go to lift this leg up, you're going to fall backwards. So we need to be able to shift our weight forward. We then need to be able to bend our knee, then lift our toes up, then bring our knee up, straighten our knee, put our heel down. And all of that was happening, I was standing on one leg. So number seven is single leg stance. So if you have a goal of walking, jogging, or running, you don't just practice walking, you should be practicing each of those seven movements as their own exercise. So the first one was just shifting your weight forward and back. This would be a fantastic functional exercise because it's literally a component of walking, jogging, and running. Another one is bending your knee. You can practice bending your knee. And if any of those seven are too challenging, you can always practice it seated or with a mobility aid or even lying on your side, your back. There's lots of different positions. But having the goal and breaking it down mm -hmm. into what movements you need, that's what it means to have a functional exercise. That's that's brilliant. Um, you know, and when you when you share that, it becomes really clear. You're you're not joking. I mean, each individual movement becomes its own thing. Absolutely. Um, I love when I'm walking with a patient um, and they've trained with neuro PT because right before they start walking, you can almost hear the physical therapist chest up, arms back. You know, it's like they go. Ch -ch 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 you know, and then you start to watch the gate mechanics. It's really kind of awesome. Somebody's listening to us right now. Maybe they're, they've gotten away from exercise and they're not sure how to start again. What would be top line things that they want to keep in mind? I know that's kind of a big question. The top line thing that I always like to think of is to do the thing that's hard. If okay. you feel like I have no idea where to start, mm -hmm. I have so many goals I want to work on, I'm feeling weaker, more off balance, whatever it might be. What, what do I even do? What's the best exercise for me? Mm -hmm. I get that question all the time. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I like to say is to do the thing that's hard as an exercise. So if standing up off of a low or squishy surface, like a couch or the toilet seat, potentially, practice doing that as an exercise. You'd want to make it a little bit easier at first because it's hard for you to do and you do want to be successful. So if you're doing it from a couch, maybe put an extra cushion, yeah. but practice standing up and sitting down off of your couch with that extra cushion. And so that is another way to get functional exercise in, especially if you feel like you have no idea where to start mm -hmm. is to do the thing that's hard as an exercise throughout your day. But I will just give people the warning. Oftentimes what happens is as one thing is no longer hard, you'll notice something else is hard. Yeah. And sometimes that can feel like a bad thing. You'll feel like, what the heck? This happens all the time as you improve your walking of what the heck I'm not, I don't have foot drop anymore, mm -hmm. but now I'm noticing Turns my, my hip, hip is dropping. <laughs> and, and I always like to think that's a good thing. Like we're mm -hmm. fixing one thing so that we can uncover other things that were likely there all along they just weren't a priority because something else was causing you more difficulty. So you couldn't even get there yet. Exactly. Yeah. So if that does happen, it's actually a good thing. It doesn't feel good in the moment, but it's a good thing. And then you move on to that. I practice in Ohio and not dissimilar to your neck of the woods. It gets really cold here. So as we record this video, it's, it's kind of chilly outside. And invariably, uh, people impacted by MS in my neck of the woods get stiff. We spend a lot of time talking about the, the value of stretching. 
I wonder if you could give us some pointers or tips. Absolutely. There's two most important things when we're talking about stretching. Mm -hmm. And the first is making sure you're stretching the correct muscle group that's tight. Mm -hmm. And the second is making sure you're holding the stretches long enough. As you just said, we have very similar temperatures. It's very cold here as well. And so often recently, I'm having the conversation with lots of my clients about oh my gosh, I'm so stiff and tight and spastic, but I don't know why I'm stretching all day long. Yeah. And then I ask those, those specific questions of what stretches are you doing? And they might list 10 stretches, but none of them are for the muscles that they have the tightness in. So that would be the first thing. If you have tightness on the back of your thigh, make sure you're stretching the back of your thigh. That would be your hamstring muscle. Or if it, the tightness is in your calf, make sure you're including stretches for that area. But then my second question is, okay, you're stretching all day long, but how long are you holding those stretches for? Most of the time, people will say five to 10 seconds. Research shows it needs to be at least 20 to 30 seconds. And so you might be doing the right stretches, but just not holding long enough to actually reap the benefits. So make sure that you're stretching the muscles that need stretched yeah. and make sure that you're holding it for at least a 20 or 30 count so that your muscle figures out what it's supposed to be doing. Exactly. And not only that, but you want to hold for the 20 to 30 seconds, two to four times per yeah. side. So right. it's not just one and done. You, it would actually be probably about three to five minutes, not just let me do this quick stretch and then move on to what I'm doing. And it would be more effective for you to slow down, do those three to five minutes of stretching for the right muscle groups yeah. about three times a day than it would be to stretch all day long, like 20 different times, but you're not holding it long enough. I'm so happy you said that because very often what I will ask families to do is when you, I tell them when you wake up, before you exit your bedroom, stretch. But back, hamstrings, calves are the ones that I'm mostly thinking about. And then when you enter your bedroom at night, before you climb into bed, do it again. So we're stretching at bookends. Then all you have to do is stretch once during your lunch hour. And many times patients need less oral baclofen or less antispasmodics because the stretching is really reducing the spasticity a notch or two. Yeah, I'm glad that you say that because so often people think that if they stretch once a day, that's enough. Because what usually what happens is they'll say, well, I stretch for an hour every day. Mm -hmm. And that's fantastic. But if you only stretch in the morning, you have 24 hours now to get tight again so that you have to stretch again in the morning. So by doing it at least three times, which is usually what I recommend as well, you are reducing the amount of time that you have to get really tight again by maintaining some of that flexibility. What do you think about partner stretching? You know, sometimes my patients have difficulty getting into the right position and I always joke and say, turn it into foreplay, you know, but, but, but can you give some comments about like asking um, a significant other or who may be in the house to help with stretching? Is that something that you recommend? Yeah, I will say it's a different type of stretching. There's a few okay. different types. When mm -hmm. you're doing it on your own, usually it's a form of active stretching, okay. meaning your muscles might be working a little bit as you're stretching because you're the one doing the doing stretch, it. your body's okay. moving. Whereas when someone else does it, like a partner, even if it's a physical therapist, anyone else, it's passive stretching. So your body usually can be more relaxed because someone else is doing the work and everyone's body is different. For some people, they feel better after active stretching. For other people, they feel more flexible after passive stretching. For Got others, it. it's a combination. Out. Yeah. Got so it. I always recommend trying both because you won't know unless you try. So I always encourage that passive partner stretching at least once just to see how did it affect you. And if it was helpful, continue that moving forward. It wouldn't have to be three times a day per se. Maybe twice per day is your active stretching. Mm -hmm. And then the third time is partner passive. So it's really up to what fits your lifestyle. I love it. That makes a lot of sense. Another thing that's always very top of mind for me is risk of fall and, and the importance of balance. I feel like so much of NeuroPT is so good at helping people um, not fall and, and have better balance. What would you recommend as far as 
entry-level balance exercises for an ambulatory patient to try to up their game a bit? Yeah, this is such a great question. So most people where you might think that you would start is practicing balancing with your eyes closed or mm -hmm. balancing with moving your head. Those mm -hmm. are okay exercises, but where I like to start is actually that first exercise where I demonstrated when I was practicing walking. Mm -hmm. the, the main thing that we need to do when it comes to balance when we're moving is weight shift. Shifting. We okay. need to be able to shift our weight forward and backwards in a staggered stance, maybe even side to side. So where I start with all of my patients is some form of weight shifting, whether that's staggered stance or side to side. Then Can I try? Can I yeah. try? Okay. Yeah, go for it. All right. So you're talking about, I can't get in frame here. So you're talking about not doing like crazy wild stuff, but literally shifting forward onto the front leg and then shifting back. Yep. So you'd shift your weight forward as much weight as you can without your knee locking, which can be common in MS and without totally losing your balance. It's okay to feel a little unsteady, but okay. how much weight can you put onto your front leg? Stay there for about three to five seconds and then back up and put your weight on your back leg. Stay there for three to five seconds. And you just repeat over and over again. That's fantastic. So, so if you have gotten comfortable with that first aspect of being able to transfer weight on the front leg, on the back leg, um, if you're, if you're then comfortable going back and forth, what's, I'm just, what's the next step? I'm just curious. And we always want to think what's the next functional step, not just what's another exercise. Yeah. So the next functional step would be still shift your weight forward. Can you shift enough weight where your back leg comes off the ground? So now it's more of a weight shifting into a single leg stance position okay? because that's the position that we need to be in, in order for the other leg to advance forward. Nice. So okay. do you want me to demonstrate that one? Yes, please. This is like a master's class. I'm so <laughs> excited. Okay. So the first variation, as you demonstrated, was staggered stance. Mm -hmm. And you just shift your weight forward. How much weight can you shift here without the knee locking, staying stable, maybe a little wobbly, that's okay. And then back. The next progression would be, can you shift 100% weight on this side and the back leg come up? Nice can come off the ground in whatever way is easiest for you. It's bending your knees really hard to do. So if that's too hard, it can come out to the side, but it would be shift your weight forward and stand on one leg for three to five seconds and then back off. The next progression would then be shift your weight forward, single leg stance as you bring this leg through. Woo, okay. <laughs> Now, sometimes when I'm talking about um, someone doing balance exercises, um, particularly if they don't have a partner or a spotter, I suggest they start off in a corner um, and maybe even with a chair in front of them just to, to make sure they, do, do, what, what, do you, um, what are your thoughts about that? I mean, we don't all have like, you know, padded gyms uh, available. How do, how do you grapple with that when you're working with someone who's going to be doing this in their living room, let's say? Yeah, I always recommend having something that is immovable. So mm -hmm. you wouldn't want to use a chair that has wheels, but okay. sometimes using the back of a couch or like a really sturdy chair. I right. love the idea of a corner of a room. If you have a mobility aid, like a rollator, trekking poles, a cane, I am game for you using those. The only thing that I like to share with people is that if you are using any form of a mobility aid, make sure that you are only putting enough body weight through it, through your arms, to be assisting you as lightly as possible. Yeah, that's a great point. And it's not not our fault. It's more of a subconscious thing that happens. Mm -hmm. But if we have something in front of us, any type of mobility aid, our brain automatically says, oh, okay, let's put all of your weight through it. It's here to help. And we just need to remember it's there to assist. It's not there to do the work for us. So using a mobility aid should still make the exercise feel challenging. It shouldn't feel easy. It should just make it a little bit safer and feel easier than if you weren't having some, some little bit of support. That's all. Those are great tips. Thank you for sharing yeah. them. And you know, another thing that I'm always thinking about as it relates uh, to exercise, when we think about balance, we think about flexibility um, is core strength. You know, I tell people I'm not impressed by big guns. You know, I am impressed by a big butt or a big back or big hamstrings because 
um, you know, that posterior chain is so important. Um, can you speak a little bit about um, how we work about strengthening, you know, because I, I don't want someone to think back to when they used to play football and they need to be doing snatches and bench presses. That might not be the recommendation. So would you talk about that pretty please? Yeah. So when we think about core strengthening, again, it's most important that we think about the positions that we need to use our core in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if you're used to doing crunches, that's great. But when you have MS, your brain and spinal cord and neural pathways don't have the same carryover, meaning you could get full core strength in a crunch position lying on the ground or on your bed, but you go to stand up and that core is non-existent because yeah. you haven't practiced standing-based core exercises. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So when it comes to the core, I always like to practice seated core exercises first okay. and then progress to standing. And it really depends on where you're currently at. For some people, where we start is instead of resting on the back of your chair, mm -hmm. you pull yourself up tall and stay here for as long as you can. And okay. then you can rest again and then up tall. A more advanced version might be you're sitting at the edge of your chair and you hinge backwards and then Love up. It. So this is more of like a seated crunch or a seated lean back. But to if your you point, will. much more functionally relevant because that's something the person's doing all day long um, and we want to get better at it. That's that's brilliant. That's a really great uh, example. Thank you. When, when I think about the getting on and off the toilet, because I feel like a lot of slips and falls happen in, in patients' bathrooms. Um, and when you were talking about doing a, like a squat on the toilet, I think that's another opportunity for engaging the core, right? Absolutely. And one thing that I like to say to my clients is every time after you go to the bathroom, do five squats. You're Love there it. already. And that way you're just kind of fitting exercise in throughout your day if you're able to. I'm going to steal that if you don't mind. That's a, that's Absolutely. a huge tip. You know, I always feel like it's important not to forget the importance of cardiovascular health. And then sometimes people look at me like I'm cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs because they say, Aaron, how, how am I supposed to do that? I oftentimes recommend things like stationary bikes, stationary rower, you know. Um, can you share with us uh, some of your best practices for helping with cardiovascular health? Absolutely. And what we probably should talk about before we get to some examples, in case people don't know, is that aerobic exercise done prior to more strengthening functional-based exercises actually primes your brain for neuroplasticity. So you're even more likely to find or strengthen those neural pathways just simply by doing aerobic exercise first. Mm -hmm. It's still newer research, so we don't have like fine details on mm -hmm. how long it should be or whatnot, but doing it first is really helpful. I personally like to do aerobic exercise with my upper body, with my arms. Okay. Okay. Because then you aren't fatiguing your legs for the leg strengthening exercises that would likely follow. So some that I typically do is sitting up nice and tall hands mm -hmm. are just closed. You're not squeezing them, but just closed and you punch forward and to increase your heart rate. You can go faster than what feels normal to you. Or you it's can hard. add power. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can add some power to it or more motion. So that would be one. You could do upper body jumping jacks. And again, we're seated. So there's yep. no risk of falling. Right. And you're keeping your core tight at the same time. So it's also so, core engagement. So just you like you were saying, we're leaning forward. So we're not leaning back in the chair. Right. If you're able to, you're not touching the back of your chair. Okay. Yep. Well, tell, I interrupted yep. you. Some rolling punches away from your body. You could then go the other way. Nice. There's there's so many different upper body ones that you can do. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. what you would do is I usually pick three and then do one for about 30 to 60 seconds, quick break, maybe five to 10 seconds and go right into the next one for about a minute, take a quick break right into the next one. So that ultimately you are not giving your heart too much time to rest and it gets that heart rate up really quick. It's kind of like a circuit of sorts. Right, exactly. That's phenomenal. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm taking home a bunch of awesome tips here. I wanted to ask about assist devices. Um, what are your thoughts, for example, about some of these really uh, new uh, devices like the psionic sleeve or 
or integrating like a walk aid into exercise? What, what do you think about those kind of things? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm a big fan of them. I love the idea and the concepts behind them. Mm -hmm. But one thing that's really important to understand and I think to implement is to not rely on them for your exercises. Because oftentimes what can happen if let's say you have this psionic neural sleeve and you're exercising with it on all the time, mm -hmm. it is possible that you, you could have improved bending of your knee and lifting of your leg and your ankle, but only if you're wearing it. And there might be opportunities where in the middle of the night, you have to get up to go to the bathroom. You're you not wearing on. it. Right. And so what I suggest is to do one round of your exercises using the device, whether it's the neural sleeve, walk aid, whatever, but then also do one round with it off, or maybe one day your whole routine is with it on another day, your whole routine is with it off. And I have seen a good amount of clients that I work with actually not need to use the device as much because they're strengthening even without, without it on. So they get stronger without using it. That's an excellent point. That's an excellent point. Share with us where we can find you because if people don't know about you, they, they need to. Yeah, of course. So I'm on YouTube as well. So Dr. Gretchen Hawley is my YouTube channel. I'll throw links in the description down below. Awesome. And then I also have a podcast called The Missing Link. I have an Instagram channel, which is Dr. Gretchen. My website is missinglink.com. So that's, that's where you can see all the services that I offer. And can you talk a little bit about some uh, excitement surrounding your book? Um, if, if people haven't seen your book, they need to, but tell us a little bit about it. Absolutely. I actually have a copy here. I always have a copy on my desk. So it's also called The Missing Link. The hardcover or paper copy uh, came out in July of 2023 and the audiobook in January of 2024. So the goal with this book is that you can learn all of my top tips and tricks and exercises in one place. I do have my online wellness program where if you're more of a visual learner and you want to see me demonstrating all the exercises, exercises and you want to be able to ask me your personalized questions, that's more of my online program, also called The Missing Link. But for those who just prefer to read or listen to some education and knowledge of what to do, the book or audiobook would be the best option. So if someone did want to work with you one-on-one, uh, -on -one, how do we go about that process? What's in, How do we contact you? Yeah, so I can give you a link for the application to work with me one on one. And that would be truly one on one where we meet on zoom every two weeks. And we create a program together, we progress together as well. Or if you're looking more for just a group setting, but still being able to have your questions answered, that can be done in the Missing Link online wellness program. So I can give you links for both of those. All right, I'll throw those down below because people need to need to check them out. Um, I, I am so excited that I got a chance to talk to you. I've picked up a bunch of things that I'm excited to bring to clinic. So thank you very much. Um, one last question. Could I invite you to come back sometime soon? Absolutely, I'd love that. <laughs>